Well, uh, let me begin just mentioning my uh, co-authors, Chad Landis, my colleague at uh, University of Texas, and uh, Michael Borden, a former PhD student and postdoc who's now working at Coreform in Orem, Utah. So the outline is, I'll say a few words about isogeometric analysis. The last few times I've spoken at uh, uh, COMPLOS, I've emphasized uh, mostly the phase field uh, works. I'll do that to an extent today too, but I want to kind of set this in the context of isogeometric analysis today. Um, I'll talk about the attributes of phase field. Uh, I think they're, they're fairly well known, but they, they are worth mentioning and uh, do most of the technical things that I would like to uh, talk about in the context of brittle fracture, uh, describe the basic second order theory that most of the people in the field tend to be using these days, then a fourth order theory that uh, we proposed a few years ago, which has gotten some attention, but I think it's suffered a little bit because of uh, some statements that were made about it, and I'll try to correct those and then talk about uh, the stress degradation function. You can think of this as sort of uh, the connection of the phase field concept with uh, damage mechanics because it expresses the damage to uh, an existing constitutive formulation. And different variants on that theme, a quadratic and a cubic, and uh, their different properties. And then uh, some recent developments on other second order theories that have been proposed recently that have not these ideas have not yet been extended to the fourth order theory, but I think they're important and worth mentioning. There, there are many ideas out there. Now, this, this is a, a rapidly growing area. Then I'll say only the briefest things about uh, ductal fracture and, and conclude. So really, the isogeometric setting here was uh, prompted by the uh, problem of developing uh, computational models from CAD, from computer-aided design. Uh, this is the picture from a study at Sandia National Laboratories that was done some years ago, and it was to uh, create, uh, create an anatomy of the overall problem-solving process from CAD design through analysis. And the conclusion of that study, which was very comprehensive, uh, was that uh, creating finite element models from CAD was taking more than 80% of overall analysis time, and it was a major engineering bottleneck. Things really haven't gotten much better in many places, although there are now signs that uh, uh, very rapid progress is being made on some fronts. But if you're working in the classical context, it still is the dominant uh, uh, cost. In fact, Robert Clay was interviewed by one of my other former PhD students uh, about a year ago, and he said that at Sandia, the situation had actually gotten worse, he felt, because the solvers were getting faster, and consequently, it was now about 90% of the time was constructing models. The other thing is, uh, in order to facilitate mesh generation, uh, you do a lot of things to simplify the CAD model. You remove a lot of uh, features that are part of the, the CAD uh, uh, description, which is in some sense the exact geometry. So you in, induce approximations, and often those errors can be very, very significant in analysis. So the question is, why is uh, it so difficult to create finite element meshes from CAD? What is taking all the time? Well, if you take a simple example, like the B pillar of a Honda here, this is just one pressed piece of metal. It's formed, uh, shaped, there's some holes drilled in it. Why does it take so long to build a model for that one simple piece? Well, what you're really seeing is computer graphics. You're seeing a trimmed CAD, CAD file. If you look at the untrimmed CAD file, this is what you see. It consists of images of 1,280 rectangular patches. They overlap, they intersect, but those intersections have gaps and uh, they're not watertight. All of that has to be fixed. All of this extraneous material has to be removed when you build uh, a model. So even for a simple piece like this, it's rather con uh, complicated. So the objectives of isogeometric analysis were to reconstitute finite element analysis within CAD geometry, and therefore essentially simplify model development by eliminating model development. 
and then integrating design and analysis, integrate the, the product development process. And that's the essence of it. So it's built on the technologies of computational geometry, the ones that are used in design, animation, graphic art, and visualization. And it includes the polynomial-based finite element analysis as we know it, as special cases, but it offers many possibilities. And these are the things that have been explored now over the years in isogeometric analysis. Precise and efficient geometric modeling, of course. Simplified mesh refinement algorithms, very nice refinement techniques, hierarchical techniques that are, are very powerful. Uh, smooth basis functions with compact support. So you can do higher order partial differential equations quite easily. This has sort of led to a renaissance in uh, shell theory and a return to the classical Kirchhoff-Love <coughs> shell theory, which is uh, fourth order differential equations. And uh, in doing that, you also do not have any rotational degrees of freedom. You can do this completely with just displacement-based degrees of freedom. And uh, it has exhibited, and now this is, I, I think, an absolute fact, it's been proven in many different ways, mathematically as well as computationally, superior approximation properties are available. And of course, then the integration of design analysis. From the analysis point of view, the way to think of this is it's given us in the finite element community a superset of technologies to explore. NURBs, subdivision surfaces, T-splines, U-splines, many, many different technologies that can be brought to bear. And it presents us with a very, very powerful refinement strategy that's not present in the classical uh, area of K-refinement, where not only do you raise the polynomial level, the spline level, you also raise the continuity. So you can build smoother and smoother bases. So let me show a couple of examples of how this is now affecting the uh, model development process. This is an oil sump, and it was done by uh, Michael Breitenberger and Kayuvi Blitzinger's group at uh, TUM. Uh, again, this is a trimmed CAD file, so this is the graphics view of the, of the picture. This is the untrimmed file, so you see everything that has been trimmed off. And this is, again, the trimmed file on sort of a coarse resolution. And you see there's no requirement of, uh, let's say, node on node. You can have hanging nodes or T-junctions to your heart's content here. And all of the continuity is built in by classical methods from computational mechanics, like Nietzsche methods or Lagrange multipliers. In this case, it was just penalties. But uh, you can refine within the geometry, never changing the geometry, just by including so-called knots, and you can refine your mesh to your heart's content and get a very, very fine model in the same exact geometry uh, for analysis. And the analysis can be done on uh, the model and compared with finite element analysis, and if you do that, you would see something like this. In one case, you have a mesh that's smooth, the stresses seem to be relatively smooth. In the finite element case, you can see things are jumping around a bit. And there are many more degrees of freedom here. So it's very, very convenient. And this is with a uh, C1 continuous uh, basis, in essence, and you're doing a shell theory without rotational degrees of freedom. So this can be uh, done extremely rapidly. You're working directly within the CAD file. Now what's good about that is when you're done, maybe you do a uh, an optimal shape design. Whatever changes you make you're, are in the CAD file and you can return that to design uh, without ever leaving it. So it does really uh, facilitate the closed loop of design through analysis. And here's an example of how these ideas are being used now in industry. This is, uh, uh, again, a B pillar from Honda, Kenji Takata's group. This is a bad quality uh, CAD file with many, many patches, over 900 surfaces, again with gaps and overlaps. And it is essentially mapped onto one trimmed patch. Uh, LS Dynac can run that directly, and you run that, and it's very quick. So much faster than the traditional methods, and quite accurate results as well. In fact, more accurate results in this case. 
Now, uh, this can be uh, scaled up to 3D, and I, I think this is where really great inroads are being made because uh, this process can be essentially automated. And there's some technology now that is out in the commercial sector that is util util utilizing ideas like this. If you have a CAD design that is really a solid, well, the CAD design is a B-REP or a T-spline in this case, which is just a surface model. T-splines are unstructured uh, splines. What you can do is just drop that into a box, say, of B-splines, and then just strip away all of the uh, elements that are not intersecting the design, and then refine the mesh for the areas of interest. And this is done with the so-called finite cell method of Ernst Wonk and colleagues. And this is the quadrature mesh. And quadrature is the essential ingredient in getting accuracy in this approach. In fact, I would say it was Ernst's group's work that really uh, awakened people to the fact that immersed methods like this, one could get higher order accuracy very, very high order accuracy. And in addition, uh, it has been recently shown that these cut cell methods, which has become a very active area now of uh, interest, uh, if you do that with a spline background mesh, you have much better stability properties as well as accuracy properties. So you can solve a solid with essentially an automated procedure of model construction. So that's, that's essentially the background. Uh, one could also say that the trimmed CAD file, in a way, is a phase field, where what you've trimmed away is the zero phase, and the, the actual material is the one phase. Now, phase field models are what have really caused a big stir in uh, uh, fracture mechanics, because it has made uh, fracture mechanics problem solving simply solving partial differential equations. So it, that's where its power really emanates from. So in, in the case here, we're going to think of the, the phase field parameter as sort of one minus a damage parameter. So C would be zero along a crack. Uh, C would be one at intact material. And then this field C would be continuous, perhaps smooth, and would be uh, diffusing the crack to a certain extent. Now let me begin with brittle fracture, and that's how this subject began. The potential energy uh, formulation of the Griffith theory of brittle fracture is given by this expression here. This functional, which is the strain energy and then the surface energy. Now, this is not directly amenable to calculation because the problem is you don't know the surface. The surface is going to be what is produced by the fractures. So this is something that can't be directly discretized. In mathematics, this is uh, referred to as a Mum Mumford-Shaw type uh, functional. It arises in, in image processing. And I think the breakthrough uh, in the mathematical image processing area was to approximate it in the manner of Ambrosio Tortelli, where you approximate the surface integral by an integral over the entire volume. And the recognition that this theory could be applied to fracture mechanics was done by Bourdin, Frankfurt, Marigo in uh, papers in about 20 years ago. And uh, they opposed it, as you see here. This is, the, uh, this is now the regularization of the surfaced fracture integral into a volume <coughs> integral and the phase field. The phase field is the marker. So this is, as you can see, it would uh, result in variational equations that are second order because you have a uh, gradient squared here. You would get a Laplacian. And here's an algebraic term. This term, in essence, is uh, most influential in defining the uh, structure of the actual crack. So we'll come back to that. Now, uh, in the theory, um, there is a length scale parameter. I'll say more about that later as well. And there is the uh, stress degradation function, essentially the damage function. The damage is either all or part of the strain energy, in this case, the elastic energy. Now, that has been done in various ways. There are various splits. I won't go into them. I'll just mention that they're all uh, typically trying to 
uh, just fracture areas where tension is taking place. Fractures usually occur in tension and not compression. So you're making some kind of a uh, compressive tensile split. And there have been various ways of doing this that are close to that theme, but maybe don't take it all the way. But recently, it's been discovered in the masonry literature that this problem is basically a solved problem, at least for linear elastic materials. And you can do the uh, splitting such that you really uh, just damage uh, tension and not compression. Well, the strong form of the equations emanate from then this free energy, which contains now uh, the integrands of the volume integrals, the elastic energy, the damage, and also this, the surface energy. This is the expression for the damage stress. So you're given the, the usual linear momentum equations to solve and a second order uh, in space phase field equation. And this is just the variational equation uh, obtained by differentiating uh, this expression with respect to C. So again, you can see it's second order. And you can see if there is no damage, in other words, if this is zero, then uh, C would just equal one. The material would be unaffected. Now, you can introduce in sort of a non-variational format an entropy switch, and that will prevent the healing of cracks. Once they're cracked, they're, they're done. So the main attributes of the phase field approach are simplicity and generality. You just solve these partial differential equations, and in a sense, you're done. And this is, in my mind, a very simple equation to solve. It's a scalar equation, although there are now multiple phase field theories where you have more than one phase field. But this is very simple, and uh, it's, I would say, well-conditioned, although some people would argue otherwise. It's a, a Helmholtz equation, but with the sign such that all the operators are positive. And this is the driving term. So how that works is illustrated by this uh, case where we have a uh, a crack that's inserted in a domain, and then we pull it on the top and the bottom, as you can see. Now, the point is, here's a mesh. It happens to be B splines, but that's not the main point here. Here's a mesh, and uh, this mesh is just a coherent rectangular mesh. There's no crack in the mesh. There's no geometric discontinuity. It's just put in as a zero along that line in the phase field. And... Uh, this is being pulled very fast. There's a lot of energy being put in, lots of tension, lots of cracks, lots of reflections, as you can see. It looks like it's been blown to bits. If you blow it up and then you look at what you might call a deformed mesh, this is really a linear elastic problem. So there is no deformed mesh. This is just plotting the displacements on top of it. You see spalling on the top and the bottom. These elements right in the middle have just completely opened up. Now that's, that's actually larger than actual. But in fact, all the calculations have been done on a fixed mesh with no crack, no nothing. So it's very simple in that regard. Now, this is uh, illustrating the mesh independence of the theory. These are three meshes for the same problem. You just sort of this one, uh, this mesh before, but with a different problem. You're pulling it with a, uh, a weaker force so you don't have as much uh, cracking. And you can see that essentially, qualitatively at least, the solutions are mesh independent. On the other hand, as you refine the mesh, and this is characteristic of the second order theory, you don't see much change. You just don't really see much change. This theory converges linearly to the cracked surfaces, and that's the problem. If you look at the surface energy and get the variational equation for just this uh, integral itself, you get an Euler-Lagrange equation which, which governs the uh, the, uh, the geometry of the crack. And this is what it is, and this is the solution here. Now with that, you uh, preserve uh, the actual uh, uh, fracture energy of the surface, but it's through this integral over the entire volume. And this, this support of this function, by, by virtue of the fact it's exponential, goes out to infinity. That's not really the problem here, that decay is really rather benign. The problem is the lack of smoothness here. And that lack of smoothness actually impedes uh, the convergence rate because convergence rate not only depends on the order of approximations that you're using, it depends on the smoothness of the exact solution. 
So to get around that and that linear convergence that we were seeing in problems, we introduced the fourth order theory uh, about five years ago. And that theory is given here. And you can see here we have the square of the Laplacian. So that leads to fourth order differential equations. Um, I will also point out that there have been multiple uh, definitions of the degradation function, uh, quadratic, cubic, sort of uh, linear, uh, et cetera. But, uh, and there are some that have been tuned to give you, to sort of replicate within the context of the uh, phase field theory, various cohesive zone theories. So you can do that and that can enter through here. Um, coming back to this theory though, uh, after it was proposed, it was sort of announced within the community that it didn't converge to the Griffith theory. It was an assertion, but it seemed to have uh, a bit of a negative effect. But it has now been proved by Matteo Negri that, in fact, indeed, it does converge to the limit Griffith theory of brittle fracture in both the continuum and the discrete uh, cases, and the discrete cases being where you're approximating things with B splines in an isogeometric uh, setting, and the mesh has to be order uh, the length scale of the theory. Now, that will emerge from physical information, and for actual uh, materials, it's extremely small. So that's an issue. The generality is uh, great, but uh, you need fine meshes in this theory. Now this proof has been done in 2D, but it also holds in 3D, and that was a private communication from Matteo. So this is the profile of the crack for the fourth order theory, and you can see it's smooth, and it has all of the same attributes as before, except it's smooth everywhere. And that will allow you to get higher order convergence rates, because once you pose this theory, that's your theory, and you can converge to solutions of it more rapidly than you can uh, the second order theory. And indeed, you even converge faster to the limit theory of Griffith theory, which things are obviously not smooth. But for a fourth order theory now, you really need splines or some higher order discretization technique if you want a simple Galerkin implementation. So just as illustration of the accuracy, this is just a one dimensional analysis. You just take a bar, you split it, once you do that, the strain energy has to converge to zero. And if you compute with the second order theory, you can see that there is convergence. But with the fourth order theory, it's much faster. Right here, we have about three orders of magnitude difference. And you're getting faster, uh, three times the rate of convergence. And for the uh, surface energy, you're converging again three times as fast. And this is a gap of, again, th uh, three orders of magnitude at this mesh. Now, if you take this to a multi-dimensional problem, a two-dimensional double, so-called double cantilevered beam, and you use a local hierarchically uh, refined mesh, and you do a sequence of calculations with the second order theory and the fourth order theory, you can get the convergence rate for the effective G, the effect effective fracture energy. And you can see that the convergence rate, again, in the multi-D setting is linear for the second order theory, and it's approaching three for the fourth order theory. And if you compare with linear elastic fracture mechanics, as far as the surface energy goes, you see it's, it's a bit better in the second order theory uh, and also on the strain energy approximation. And these, these affect, of course, stresses and strains. Now, both theories, both theories uh, have an issue if you use the classical quadratic stress degradation function. And I think most people are using that. I really want to uh, point out some of those deficiencies. You can see this is, this is uh, a calculation where you're seeing these shadow zones here. These are diffuse damage, and they can be attributed to the second order degradation function, this function right here. What function changes, in essence, linear elasticity in one dimension to this uh, stress-strain diagram. So you have a, an actual significant accumulation of elastic strain energy before you reach the critical strain, and then you have a very slow drop-off thereafter. Okay. So you can calculate that very simply. Now what we propose to improve upon the situation is a third order cubic degradation function some years ago, and it has an S shaped curve like this. 
And what this does is basically give you almost linear behavior right up to the critical strain. For the same L0, if the G and L0 are the same, this is what you would get. So for a brittle fracture, you would get a higher peak stress. And what that means is up to the critical strain, you're essentially linear elastic and you have uh, no damage. The phase field stays at one, and then it drops off much more rapidly uh, than the quadratic. So uh, very quickly, if we uh, look at the picture, this is the stress drain diagram. This is the uh, picture I just showed you for the uh, phase field itself. And this is the, uh, the, the uh, stress uh, degrad degradation uh, curves right here. Now, this is sort of like getting started here. If you move a little bit, you see what happens. You just stay here and then you drop down for these different states. So you're here, you're about to turn. Here, you're already uh, exhibiting some damage. And then you can run through the cycles and see what happens. So if you use that theory, uh, it behaves as advertised. It essentially gets rid of all of this diffuse damage, which is really spurious. Now these different theories have uh, interpretations as cohesive zone models, and you can see that by comparing for the, uh, this problem of a crack in a, in a plate, and you can see the stress distribution sort of, let's say, upstream of the crack. They exhibit sort of different cohesive zone type interpretation. So all these theories, the particular function G that you use, are somewhat like cohesive zone models in that respect. And actually, it has been proposed to uh, develop the uh, stress degradation function in such a way that it can replicate various cohesive zone models if one is interested in that. And of course, in the limit, as you take the length scale to zero, you would just get linear elastic fracture mechanics. Now, the combination of the second order theory and the quadratic degradation compared with the combination of the fourth order theory and the cubic degradation uh, show this way. So you can see on the same mesh, this is, everything is the same here, you get uh, much less diffusion of the cracks in this case. Now one of, the, one of the appealing things about phase field theory is if you have very, very complicated problems where you might have some uh, uh, inhomogeneities that might nucleate cracks uh, and in 3D and you might uh, want to uh, do an analysis, you can do that, and you can get very, very complicated cracking profiles in which you have surfaces that, first of all, the, the, uh, you get nucleation sites, then you have surfaces forming, they can merge, coalesce, intersect, etc. And all of that is automatically accounted for. Now let me say a little bit about some other second order theories. Uh, one of the additional things that you can vary is this uh, term right here. Uh, Historically, it's been the quadratic function. Uh, you can use linear. The, the nice thing about linear is if you use linear with a bound, you have to put an upper bound and sort of an inequality constraint in your algorithm. What that can do is via this mechanism, you can ensure linear elastic behavior up to the critical stress. So there's two ways of doing that. This is another way here. And uh, there are still other uh, proposals, combinations of the two. These were compared by J.Y. Wu in an article uh, uh, two years ago. Uh, he did this and showed this graphically in terms of the damage parameter, which is, again is one minus the phase field, so I'll just flip it so that we can compare it with what we've seen before. And you can see here's the quadratic with its infinite support. Here's the linear, which has finite support, and that's why you're elastic outside of that support. And this is a linear combination of the two that uh, J.Y. Wu pr proposed, and it also has finite support. Now, the finite support is an attribute here, and you can uh, get elastic behavior for different stress deg degradation functions, but it still has the problem of the lack of regularity at the crack tip, and this limits convergence rate and accuracy. So from a numerical analysis standpoint, uh, this is an issue. Now, another interesting development uh, was done recently by David Kamensky, uh, George Mutsan-Edis, 
and Yuri Basilev's. It was published last year. And that is to create a hyperbolic version of the phase field equation, a second order hyperbolic version. So you can see we just added a second derivative term in time and a first derivative term in time. Although this term can, from thermodynamic considerations, can be generated. Um, and this is the equation. So you select the coefficient of the second derivative such that the wave speed is bounded above by the maximum wave speed for the momentum equation. So that would be the dilatational wave speed in three dimensions. You select the uh, beta coefficient of the first order term such that the system is overdamped. And what this does now is you have uh, two hyperbolic equations, the momentum equation and the phase field equation. It facilitates efficient explicit dynamics with lump mass. So you can build a completely explicit procedure, get away from equation solving. And equation solving can become complicated if you use complicated stress degradation functions, complicated splits for the uh, energy, such as the ones coming from uh, masonry theory. Uh, there, you have many if statements, so you have lack of regularity there. So that can, uh, that would really be attractive just to be, use explicit techniques. So with those, no equations need to be solved. And this kind of fits in with sort of the philosophy of a lot of the procedures that are in commercial codes like LS Diner or Abacus Explicit. And uh, now the issue is the critical time step scales inversely with the highest frequency in the discrete system. So these are a couple of pictures I pulled out from some of my uh, books, my old finite element book and the isogeometric book. And we've taken for lumped mass with linear finite elements, which is the main technology in these codes right now, the explicit codes. Uh, the frequency here, compared with exact, the highest frequency is about 60, low 60% of the highest frequency. And when you remove outliers, and there's been technology now within the use blind community, and there's some other techniques, so you can remove so-called outlier frequencies and you can get a highest <laughs> mode like this with lump mass, and that's only about 30-something percent. So you realize then that for cubic B splines, this is cubic B splines right here, with outlier removal, you can get potentially a time step that's about twice as big for linear finite elements. And if you're familiar with explicit analysis, the time steps are extremely small because they're based on, in essence, uh, dilatational wave speed. And as a result, uh, you don't have to worry about accuracy at those small, small time steps. But if you can take twice as large a time step stably with this technology, you can actually essentially uh, double the speed of your analysis because the cost scales with the number of time steps. So let me say a couple of words about ductile fracture. In ductile fracture, one of the things you might want to do is to uh, certainly consider the peak stress as an ultimate stress or failure stress as a, as a given, as well as, let's say, the elastic properties and the fracture energy. And uh, if you do that for the different models of the cubic and the quadratic uh, stress degradation functions, uh, you get these different expressions here. And if you equivalence them to get the same peak, then what you find is actually the, uh, the cubic model uh, is giving you a much bigger L0 for the same peak stress. Now that's really uh, conducive to efficiency because you can use cruder meshes. You want to resolve L0, say have a mesh of order L0, but L0 is much bigger for the, uh, the cubic uh, than the quadratic. So that's a big advantage. In one dimension, it would mean a mesh of about uh, uh, let's say a third less elements. In two dimensions, it would mean a mesh of an order of magnitude less elements, and in three dimensions, uh, quite a bit more than that, as you can see. Well, maybe you couldn't see. I was reading that off the wrong slide. Sorry about that. Okay, so there they are. Now, um, this is a, uh, an example, uh, again, of a... Uh, but a ductile fracture example. I won't go into the details, but I'll just point out that how small L0 can be. I mean, the sample is actually rather small. It's only about 17 millimeters across here, but it's uh, about 0.03 millimeters is the L0 that arises from physical data. 
Now, one of the things I just want to emphasize here, too, is the effect of triaxiality. It's absolutely essential to get the kind of results that uh, confirm experimental results. So this is the um, uh, geometry, locally refined, multi-patch nerves, as you can see, exact geometry. This is the cubic stress degradation function results. This slice is right through that midsection. So this is giving you uh, sort of, it's at an angle, but it's giving you that uh, slice, as you can see. So without triaxiality, you get one solution. The crack forms right at the notch. And with triaxiality, it forms near the notch, but not right at the notch. It, it, it sort of nucleates right here. And these, are, it, it, these results are in agreement with uh, Ravi Shandar, my colleague at UT's experiments. With the quadratic, you see a very, very diffuse and different picture. And I can show you that by comparison here. What you can see is that uh, this doesn't look very much like this at all. Very, very diffuse again for the reasons I mentioned before. So in conclusion, I will say the main attributes of the phase field approach to fracture are its simplicity and generality. It can be very easily computed. Uh, and it's the fact that it automatically handles nucleation, growth, coalescence, propagation, branching, merging, et cetera. And um, I would say the main disadvantage is the fineness of the meshes that are required because uh, uh, L0 is essentially going to be coming from physics and it's very small for real materials. So that's the challenge to the phase field community, is somehow get beyond that to uh, produce more efficient versions. The fourth order phase field theory um, attains higher rates of convergence than the second order theory, and thereby it improves the stress strain and surface energy approximations. The cubic stress degradation function provides better representation of brittle fracture by eliminating diffuse damage, and it enables the use of significantly coarser meshes for the same peak stresses in ductile fracture. Uh, the combination of the two provides, I think, an accurate and efficient computational framework for fracture, and again, I'll emphasize it does converge to Griffith theory in the limit. Uh, isogeometric analysis facilitates an implementation of the fourth order theory. You need smooth basis functions if you want a simple Im implementation. And you can do that directly within computer-aided design representations. So in the spirit of that, I'll just close with a calculation. This is a fully nonlinear calculation. Fourth order Kirchhoff love uh, shell theory. Fourth order phase field theory. <coughs> a hyperelastic material model and a cylinder that's just pressured. So this is what the result looks like. It's fixed radially at the ends and it sort of rips off the ends as you can see. This is done with a, essentially a CAD model, but it's a, whoops, going the wrong direction. It's a uh, so-called LR NURBS model. It's locally refinable as you see, nested grids like this and it works quite nicely. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention. <laughs>